Good morning, all. Great to see you. Hey, let me just say one more word about this invitation piece. Easter's in two weeks. I have a question. How many of you took a step in your relationship with God, took a, took a step in your spiritual journey when someone invited you to some kind of God event? Raise your hand. I mean, you got invited to some event and it made a difference in your life. That's a lot, a lot of folks. And so it matters when you uh, love someone enough to invite them to hear the good news of God's plan for their life. So grab one of these. You've got them in your bulletin. We've got a bunch more sitting out in a stack at the information table in the cafe. If you uh, have a big neighborhood or big staff or whatever, grab as many as you think you'll need and be invitational. It's a good thing. Thanks for your help with that. Welcome back to 24 Hours That Has Changed the World. This is the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. We take him from approximately 6 p.m. on Thursday evening all the way to 6 p.m. on Friday evening. We have followed Jesus now in this last Passover Seder with his disciples, this last supper. He then led the disciples through the Kidron Valley up to the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, where he prayed perhaps the most courageous prayer, had the most courageous moment in all of human history when he determined to die for the sins of the world. He's then betrayed with a kiss, led back under arrest through the Kidron up to the lower city and then to the upper city of Jerusalem where he stands trial before the Sanhedrin in the home of the high priest, Caiaphas. They find him guilty of blasphemy. Blasphemy against God, ironically, blasphemy against himself. Because they don't have the, the authority to execute capital punishment, they now take him to capitals, uh, to Caiaphas, I'm sorry, to Pilate's residence, the Antonia Fortress, uh, there at the upper city of Jerusalem, where he stands trial before the governor, Pilate. Pilate can't find anything wrong with him. But wishing to please the crowd, he convicts him of insurrection, sentenced him to death by crucifixion. And that's where we pick up the story today. Today we want to consider the torture and the humiliation that Jesus endured on our behalf. 24 hours that changed the world. Today's text again, back to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. I'm going to read for us verses 15 through 23. As you're able, I'll invite you to stand to hear these important words. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns, set it on him. They began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country. And they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Let me ask you a question. When's the other place in the New Testament you see the spice myrrh mentioned? It's at his birth when the kings offer gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And now this spice emerging again. Uh, coming full circle in Jesus' life. May God bless the reading of his word today. You may be seated. It's worth lingering on the last hours of Jesus' life before the crucifixion, trying to understand more clearly, more precisely, the torture that he underwent and what it might say about our own lives. As you know, we've, we've tried to identify with the characters involved in the Passion of the Christ, and it's been challenging and perhaps provocative for us in a number of ways. But we know in this context now, this sequence, that Jesus is flogged, then taken away by the Roman guards who led him to the governor's headquarters where they mock him and humiliate him. Consider then this costliness of grace, the great price that Jesus paid for us. We see him first enduring the physical torture 
of flogging. When Rome wished to install terror, they used methods that were so brutal that even the most hardened spectators would have to turn away from it. Such beatings, as you might imagine, might guess, had a very strong deterrent effect. In one form of Roman flogging, the victim is stripped, stretched over a post, lashed down, more than one Roman soldier, usually two, these lictors take their turn striking the victim with whips. The whip itself, probably a multi-fingered whip, like a cat of nine tails, this flagrum on the end of which is braided bits of stone and metal, glass, bone, or nails, not only meant to bruise the victim, severely bruise the victim, but to lacerate the skin as well. The third century church historian Eusebius said that Roman flogging often, and I quote, the sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles and tendons and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. So flogging was designed to inflict incredible pain and do significant damage to the victim. Just enough left, though, of physical strength after the flogging for them to be able to carry the cross beam of their cross to the site of crucifixion. You should know that the first century church was deeply in touch with the passion of the Christ. They, they drew from the Old Testament prophecies and from the Psalms the words that relate to the suffering servant. One of those references that they put to music and would sing in their fellowship meetings in the first century is found in Isaiah chapter 50. Look at these words on the screen. And let me remind you that these words were written by Isaiah 400 years before Jesus lived on the earth. How poignant and relevant they are. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. So there was the physical torture of flogging, but there was more than that for Jesus. There was also the emotional torture through humiliation. Jesus, we, we know, did not beg for mercy. He didn't defend himself before Pilate. And this probably further uh, infuriated the Romans. He, was not begging for, he wasn't begging for his life. He was, he was stoic. He was, he was brave. And he endured the punishment. And they weren't content, of course, just to merely tear his flesh. They decided to dehumanize him as well, to break his spirit. Mark tells us that then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, and they called together the whole cohort. Now, in the Antonio Fortress there, and a cohort of Roman soldiers ranged anywhere from 300 men to 600 men. Now, imagine now it's about 8 o'clock on Friday morning. 8 o'clock on Friday morning. Jesus has been up all night with his disciples in the meal and in prayer, now under arrest before the Sanhedrin, guilty of blasphemy, now before Pilate, ultimately now flogged to within inches of his death. He's dehydrated, he is weakened, he's bloodied. And this cohort now of hundreds of Roman soldiers come out to make a mockery of him. They strip him naked. He's exposed, he's vulnerable, he's bloodied. They, they surround him. They take a crown of thorns uh, and a, a parody of the laurel wreath, press it down on his head. They give him, they give him a reed to hold, something, something like a cattail. They, they surround him, they mock him, they spit in his face, they punch him in the head. They kneel down in mocking worship, hail to the king of the Jews. It is a horrible, horrible thing. One of the robes from the soldiers is placed over his shoulders, and it is humiliation of the highest degree. <coughs> this picture, which I've just tried to paint for us, is something that we need to focus on. We need to bring it uh, to bear in our own minds. The, the picture of this shamefully cruel and inhumane sport at the expense of a tortured man that we need to really fix our gaze on so we can get a clear and tragic glimpse of what humanity did when God decided to come to the earth as a man. What we did to God when he became a man is this image. This is how we responded. And it begs us to ask the question, why did these soldiers do this? It wasn't necessary for all of them in the cohort to come out and mock him. Why such a grand 
coronation for Jesus in this mocking form, this brutal torture, both physically and emotionally. Why did they humiliate him? Why did they, why did they inflict this kind of damage on him? The only thing Jesus was guilty of was loving people and preaching the good news of the kingdom of God and blessing those who were downcast and healing the sick and recovery of sight to the blind. What kind of men would do such a thing? In every part of the story, we've met people who did things that are difficult to imagine. The Sanhedrin, the most educated, highest religious order in, of the day, highest status in the culture, they demanded that Jesus be put to death. The crowd cried out for him to be crucified. Pontius Pilate sentenced him to satisfy the crowd. And now these Roman soldiers delighting in tearing the flesh from his bones and spitting on him and humiliating him. What kind of a person would do such a thing? I'm sorry to say that this whole episode, in part at least, reminds me of the images from Abu Ghraib prison during the Iraq war. We know that American soldiers stripped Iraqis naked, mocked them, humiliated them, photographed their handiwork. What could possibly lead men and women to do such things? I mean, were they having a bad day? I mean, what happened? Are there times when we as ordinary people can actually lose our humanity and in our fear and paranoia somehow ourselves support policies or even practices that in other different times, better times, we could resist? Let me remind you, friends, if you want to have a moral voice in the world, if you want to have moral authority, if you want to be able to say to a friend, look, what you're doing is destructive, it's self-destructive, it will ruin your life. This is a better way to live. This is right and this is wrong. In order to have moral authority in someone else's life, you have to have a moral life yourself. You can't live one way and then say another, another way. You have to actually practice what you believe. That gives you moral authority. Now, no one's perfect and everybody fails and everybody in this room is a hypocrite. I got it. But it requires a moral life in order to have moral influence in the world. As a nation, you can't expect to have moral influence in the world by behaving immorally. And the Abu Ghraib experience is just another example of this. You say, well, now, wait a minute. This is a matter of national security. Terrorists are threatening American lives here and there, and, and information has to be gathered, and so the ends justifies the means, or the means justifies the ends, rather. And that's just not true. Listen to me carefully. Torturing another human being is always wrong. There are no exceptions to that rule. It's always wrong to torture another human being. I can see I'm stirring it a little bit. I've invited uh, each of us to stop and see ourselves in this story. Now I want to invite yourself to see yourself in these Roman soldiers that day. Doing so will help us to recognize that human beings throughout history have been capable of inhumanity toward one another. Painful as it is, this is the story of our existence. History reminds us, going all the way back to Noah's day, when God was so grieved at the violent way people treated each other that he sent floodwaters to destroy the earth. It's easy for us to say, well, I could never do what those Roman soldiers did to Jesus. I could never have been one of those people who took delight in mocking and lashing and terrorizing this innocent man. But I think we need to be careful of making such claims. Have you ever wondered what was so different about the Germans of the 1930s and the 1940s from an average American living today? Ever wondered about that? I have. Why were they... So many ordinary people willing to kill their Jewish neighbors under certain circumstances. Ordinary people, I think, can be persuaded to do extraordinarily horrible and awful things, given the right combination of ideology or authority or gradual desensitization. All of us become, can become derelict this way. Monsters, perhaps, capable of destroying others with rep weapons that range everything from harsh words to gas chambers. It's a reality we have to face. We need to guard against by God's grace. Then the Bible says they led him to be crucified. They led him to be crucified. 
When the soldiers were done with Jesus, they put his clothes back on him, led him from the courtyard of Pilate's fortress toward the rocky hill on which he would be crucified. Calvary is about a third of a mile from the Antonio Fortress. And so Jesus now, under the weight of the burden of this cross beam, probably quite heavy, and in his weakened condition, maybe got a hundred yards or a couple hundred yards, and fell unable to carry this cross beam. And there's a bystander there. Mark describes him, identifies him as Simon of Cyrene. Now, Cyrene was a place, a city in northern Libya. He was probably in town for the Passover, a Jew there. And we don't know why Simon is in cl close proximity to Jesus. In that particular moment, we don't know if he's a secret follower of Jesus. We don't know if he's curious or he's just in the wrong place or right place at the wrong place at the right time. We don't know. But we know Simon is there. And Mark adds this little description, a little information about Simon, and that, he's, that he has two sons, Alexander and Rufus. Now, this is curious because none of the other Gospels identify the boys. But here's Alexander and Rufus, and we can make a connection. We know, that, we know that Mark wrote his gospel, the one that we've been rehearsing these past several weeks. He wrote this gospel approximately 36 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So from this Passion Week, this weekend, these 24 hours, from that date, Mark wrote his gospel about 36 years after that. And we should know that Mark wrote his gospel with the Roman church, the, the Greek audience in mind. All the gospel writers wrote to a particular audience. It helps us decipher why they're saying things the way they are. Matthew's gospel is to a Hebrew audience, and that explains so many Old Testament references and, and context. And so Mark's gospel is identifying the Roman church and Greek believers, and so he's writing to the folks who would be in Rome. And so Mark adds this little anecdote. Simon's sons were Alexander and Rufus. Now, we also know that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans, which is a theological treatise, again, targeted to the church in Rome, thus the name Romans. And so Paul wrote in Romans chapter 16, verse 13, an interesting verse. It says simply, um, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and greet his mother, who's a mother to me also. Now, we know that Paul wrote the book of Romans maybe a few years before Mark wrote the gospel of Mark all to the church at Rome. And so we can, we are left to speculate and there's connection now. So Paul says, and greet Rufus, who's a leader in the church in Rome, selected of the Lord, and also his mother, who's been a mother to me. So Paul is close to this family. And Mark includes it in his gospel, we find it in our text today, as a reference point. It's interesting. We can, with some degree of certainty, suggest that Simon of Cyrene, his boy Rufus, has become, now 36 years later, he's a leader in the church, mentioned in the Gospel of Mark because his Roman readers would recognize, yeah, we know Rufus and Alexander and their mother. Simon is probably long since dead, but now Rufus is a leader in the church in the first century, 30 or 40 years after the death of Jesus, and we find this, con this, con this connection. And what we can surmise from this is that no matter what brought Simon of Cyrene to the moment when they commandeered him to carry the cross of Jesus, we know that carrying the cross of Jesus all the way to Golgotha and watching Jesus then be crucified and dead, that day changed the life of Simon of Cyrene and probably influenced him to become one of the first believers in the work of Jesus to atone for our sins. And not only that, but he influenced his children and his wife. And now four decades later, his children are leading the church and his wife is still prominent among believers. That's the kind of influence that you want to have, right? I can't wait to meet him, Simon of Cyrene. And he's in heaven today. He's probably a little cocky. That's how I imagine him. Where's that Simon of Cyrene? He's, yeah, I'm the guy. <laughs> Salvation of the world made possible by me. He had never gotten that cross there. Without me. You're welcome. I just imagine, I don't know. Yeah, you know, just a little fist pump. Pow, yeah, you're the man. <laughs> Love that guy. There are some things we can learn from this 
sequence in the story. The first is the brokenness of humanity. Friends, we have to lean into this. It's so important. We have to contemplate the reality of our neediness because we are our broken people. What God was trying to say through the suffering and death of Jesus, all of these events surrounding the last 24 hours of Jesus' life on the earth, speaks of many things, but one thing is center that you cannot avoid and we must embrace, and that is the fallenness and brokenness of humanity. We are broken. And as we've seen already, each of the persons taking part in this tragedy is a reflection of that brokenness. Let me rehearse again. The disciples fell asleep and then fled in fear when Jesus was arrested. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. The Sanhedrin wished him dead. The crowds preferred a Messiah preaching violence, Barabbas, rather than a Messiah preaching love. The governor wished to satisfy the crowd, and now the soldiers took delight in torturing and dehumanizing an innocent man. This story of what human beings did when God walked among us is not just an indictment of those men and women present in the day. It's an indictment of all of us, of all of humanity. And we are meant to realize that there is simply something deeply wrong with us, that we are broken and in need of forgiveness. We are, we, we, we are, we are fractured and in need of God's healing grace. Some of you, no doubt, have been to Washington, D.C. and to the National Holocaust Museum where you can see photos and video footage and exhibits documenting the atrocities that occurred under Hitler's, quote, final solution. The museum is a testament to the gross inhumanity of the Nazis, but it's also a witness of complicity of millions of ordinary people in Europe who refuse to resist the evil, including many leaders in the church. And sometimes we sit a bit too piously here in America pointing fingers at that generation of Europeans but let me just remind you that history records that while the United States was central uh, to, the, to the role of defeating Hitler, we, we get that, we too as a government refused to receive large numbers of Jewish immigrants from Europe at the same time that they were being exterminated in Hitler's final solution. The Holocaust then is an indictment not only of the Nazis, but of the entire human race. It really is. And visiting the National Holocaust Museum leaves you deeply moved and disturbed and convicted by what you see. And that's the effect. That, that's the desired aim. That's, that's the point. Visitors so deeply moved often leave this museum committed to the proposition that this should never happen again. Never again. Now, can we make the connection? In the same way, the suffering and death of Jesus are meant to affect deeply those who hear the story. It should affect us. His suffering and death are intended to be a mirror, to be held up in front of us so that we can see the condition of our own soul. This is what was required in order to satisfy the penalty of your sin and my sin. This is what it took. This was the costliness of God's grace. And this is what Jesus says to us. Do you see the extent of the, of the love of the Father? Do you understand that I have come in order to reveal that love to you? And so we see, then, second of all, the love of the one who suffered on display. Jesus knew that going to Jerusalem would end in his passion. He knew it, but he set his face. He was determined to go and do what he did. He endured the flogging, the crown of thorns, the ridicule, the humiliation, and the cross itself, determined and silent and dignified. He stood naked before the world as if to say, Do you see the extent of the Father's love for you? Do you understand that I have come that you might finally hear of a love that is willing to suffer, yea, even to die in order to win you over? Jesus was willing to look all of his enemies in the eye, even those who put him to death, and say, I love you so much that I want you to be restored because your heart and your life is broken and the only hope you have is sacrificial love sent from God himself. Paul said it this way. Look at Romans 5, verse 8. God proved his love for us and that while we were still in our sins, Christ died for us. That's good news right there, friends. It means when we were running from God saying, no thanks, God, I'm going to do my own thing, my own way, my own will, my own time. I don't need you. I don't want you. Bug off. Leave me alone. No thanks. When we were there, Jesus died for us. 
And these famous words from John's gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. See, the cross is the vehicle for demonstrating the full extent of God's love. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. And we thank God for the cross. The last thing that we learn, and we'll be finished this morning, is the power of sacrificial love. Now think about that phrase for a moment. The power of sacrificial love. Friends, there is enormous influence released through the lives of people who live in such a way that represents sacrificial love, selfless love. It's a powerful thing. You know, this week, uh, the Roman Catholic Church elected a new pope. Convocation of Cardinals got together and white smoke went up. Woohoo! We have an election. And here is a new pope. Did you, did you notice? It's a new pope. Pope Francis, taking his name from one of the great icons of Christian virtue in history, St. Francis of Assisi. And the new pope, for those who know him, apparently have many good things to say about him. It's been interesting. He's a humble man. He is a selfless man, sacrificial person. He cares for the poor and demonstrates that by his life and work. And so all these redemptive things being said about the new pope, and it's, it's encouraging. And the response to that, it's been f fun for me to watch this. Because on one hand, you see a, a pope who's apparently his profile is much like Jesus. This is a guy who seems to care about the right things in a sacrificial, selfless way. And now he's leading this billion people, Roman Catholics around the world. It's, it's something. And then the, the response to people around the world is, you know, this is curious to me. This is an interesting process. And others even going so far to say is it's making me think about my own faith. And for others to say it's making me think I need to return to the church and reconnect to things that are meaningful and substantial in my life. And friends, I'm just suggesting to you that this is a power of sacrificial love. This is, the, this is the power that people who give their lives demonstrations of sacrificial love and, and selfless acts of service actually make a difference. That's why what you do in a selfless way, in the small ways that you engage them, in the, the larger ways that we do them in our own community here, makes a difference because there's power to influence, to transform, to change people's lives through sacrificial love. And that's, that's the reason why we do the things that we do. That's why, that's why this new pope is starting to get warmth and affection from the world already as people get to know him and why Mother Teresa garnered the kind of reputation that she did because this is the power of sacrificial love. We see it at work and it, it's especially poignant through the life of Jesus. Let me give you this last story. In November of 2004, Tammy Duckworth a reservist who was called up to fight in Iraq was a co-pilot of a Black Hawk helicopter which was struck by a rocket launch grenade. When the grenade exploded near her feet, it severed her legs and crushed one of her arms. By the time the chopper crash landed, it appeared she was dead, understandably. But the soldiers in the helicopter realized that if they didn't get out and get away from the helicopter, they would surely be killed. The insurgents would be upon them in short order. But not wishing to leave Tammy Duckworth behind, they took the time to extricate her from the wreckage, dragged her for some distance through fields. Some of it, they said, was six-foot-tall grasses at great personal risk in order to get her out. They assumed she was dead. When they finally reached safety, they realized that even though she had lost half of her blood supply, that she was miraculously alive. Now here's some good news. She recovered. She has been fitted for prosthetics, and she is now fully mobile. Later in her life, she was named director of the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs. On February 3rd of 2009, Tammy Duckworth was nominated to be the Assistant Secretary of Public and Intergovernmental Affairs for the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. The United States Senate confirmed her for the position on April 22, 2009. 
That day when she was asked how she felt about the great risk her fellow soldiers took to save her, this is what Major Duckworth said. I want to put it on the screen so you can see it. You have to get up every day and seek to live in such a way as to be worthy of that kind of effort and sacrifice. Do you get it? That's the power of sacrificial love. It's the power of it. And that's exactly what the cross of Christ is meant to inspire us to do. We are to look at the cross of Jesus and we are meant to say, I have to strive to live in such a way as to be worthy of that sacrifice. And that's what we learn. as Jesus embraced his passion. I want to pray for us this morning. I trust that you'll absorb this prayer, make it your own, and make a meaningful step toward God in view of the sacrifice he's made, the costliness of his grace. Amen. Stand with me as you're able. Let's pray. Lord, today remind us that we are meant to be changed by your substitutional death, your atoning work. And in turn, we are to practice sacrificial love toward others. Lord, forgive us of the times that we have been guilty of unkind words and damaging acts toward others. Lord, we, we have seen today that the soldiers mocked and ridiculed you. Forgive us of ever hailing you as king on Sunday and then mock you by our words and our actions on Monday. Forgive us of that. Help us rather to see ourselves like Simon of Cyrene when he saw you suffer, was so moved he became a follower. And decades later, after he was gone, his wife and sons continued to serve. That's the kind of transformation we seek as we look at the suffering and the death of Christ. So Lord, today we pray, help us to live in such a way as to be worthy of that sacrifice. Thanks for hearing our prayer today. In Jesus' name, and the people said,